I wrote Fault Lines because of my love for the church. Um, we're doing this project because of love for the church. I honestly believe that the critical social justice movement represents a threat, an existential threat. Not a threat to Christianity per se, because Christianity can't be threatened. God is on his throne. He will protect his bride. However, it represents a threat to unity within the body. Welcome to the G3 Podcast. I'm Virgil Walker. I'm here with Dr. Josh Bice. And we've got an incredible episode uh, teed up for you. Uh, excited about our special guest. In fact, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Josh to let people know what we've got what we got on the board. Yeah, so today we're excited to be able to sit down and talk with our friend Vody Bauckham as we're going to be talking about the really what uh, happened back some time back, you know, with regard to social justice. And really, if I think back to the the whole scene of the social justice movement, and yes, by the way, there really was and still remains to this very day a social justice movement. Yes. And Vody was ahead of the curve in many ways, and, and he was able to help me personally. He was also able to help so many people by writing a book by the title Fault Lines. And so obviously that book has made a big splash. Many people who watch this podcast have certainly been able to uh, read that book. Yeah. But now there's there's a little study series mm -hmm. that's come out of this book that we're going to be able to talk with him about. So yeah. really looking forward to this conversation today. vody has been a good friend for many years and, and really continues to be a faithful man uh, as he serves the Lord Jesus Christ in his setting there in Zambia, but also coming here and partnering with us in various capacities and conferences and workshops and things of that nature. So it's going to be a great conversation. Good. Yeah. Excited about the conversation. I do want to remind you of a couple of dates that uh, you'll want to mark your calendar for. Uh, that is our national conference on the sovereignty of God. You'll need to mark your calendar for September 21st through the 23rd right here in Atlanta and join us. Vody will be with us. Uh, we'll have a number of just dynamic preachers that you won't want to miss. Paul Washer, Stephen Lawson. If I start naming them, we'll be here for a while. Uh, we've got nearly 30 guests that are going to be joining us. You, you, you don't, you don't want to miss this. Get on the g3men.org and get registered. And I'm telling you that on purpose because I do anticipate uh, as we're getting to the close of May, at, at the beginning of, of June, we have a price increase. Uh, and so you'll want to get in under the radar. Uh, it, make sure that you get registered, get the, the cost savings of not waiting until the last minute. And I'm hopeful, Josh, that I'll be able to come back at some point and tell people we're sold out. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Definitely jump on board and be a part of that. Uh, in addition, I want to make mention of, of two other things. If you're already registered, you'll want to participate in our pre-conference. We have two options for you in the way of a pre-conference. The first is the gospel and the state, the gospel and the state. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, about Christian nationalism, theonomy, a lot of the issues that are stirring right now dur during our day. Uh, definitely want to be a part of that. Join us September 20th. That'll be on the Wednesday. In addition to that, we've got a, a pre-conference called Gracious and Courageous. Our dear friends, GBTS, uh, Grace Bible Theological Seminary, Owen Strain will be with us on the gospel in the state. Our dear friends uh, at the Master's Fellowship will be with us on Gracious and Courageous. Those are two wonderful options that you won't want to miss. Be a part of it. Join us. Get on the website. Get registered. g 3 Men. Dot org. So now we can jump into our conversation. Yeah, now I, before we do that, Virgil, as we think about these pre-conferences, one of the things I'm looking forward to is if you choose to go to either one, one of the wonderful things is that that evening when the pre-conference is over, yes. we're actually all going to come together and we're going to be able to sit under uh, really uh, the teaching ministry of John MacArthur. Yes, absolutely. He's going to be able to address us, and we're looking forward to that as yep. well. So yep. you don't want to miss that grand opportunity. Make sure that you arrive early enough yes. to take in the pre-conference. Absolutely, absolutely. With that said, man, that wraps up all of my announcements. I'll turn things over to you and get started with our conversation. All right, so it's a privilege to have Vody Bauckham with us today for this conversation on the G3 podcast. And so, Vody, welcome. Hey, man, thank you. It's good to be here. Absolutely. As we dive into the conversation today, we want to talk to you about Fault Lines. I mean, this book that you've written that has made a big splash yeah. 
you know, in evangelicalism, yeah. Virgil, as we think about the importance of this book, I know it's been a massive encouragement to me. Yeah. What about you? What have you seen as this book was released yeah. in this culture, specifically the evangelical culture? Yeah. It was incredibly helpful, Vody, for, for, for me in particular. I know you're familiar with uh, the ministry that myself and Daryl Harrison are, are engaged in with Just Thinking. Um, it, it was a played a pivotal role in helping us really kind of understand the landscape of what's happening. This was the first time within a within a volume of, of, of pages, you know, in a book that really looked at things that began in 2017, 18, and just kind of walked us through timeline, you know, of, of all the things that happening, the divisions that were taking place within evangelicalism. You began the book by telling your story. Uh, it's, it's uh, it, you know, it's in our day and time, it's unfortunate, uh, but the reality is we almost have to lay out kind of our bona fides as black men uh, to be able to speak about subject matter as it relates to black men. But, uh, but you kind of laid that out at the beginning of your book and, uh, and really helped us to, to understand, hey, yes, I've, I've been where folks are who are claiming to be oppressed, but at the same time, there's a different way of looking at things. And then, and then you go into laying out th- just a case of what took place in evangelicalism. It was a powerful book that helped us mm. uh, as we engaged in the conversations about this subject matter. Um, you know, I don't know what your thought process was, who you were kind of targeting with the book as, it, you know, as, as far as a work is concerned, uh, but, uh, but want to get your thoughts about that in particular. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people look at those first two chapters and they say, you know, I like how you put your personal story in to, to you know, let people know that you are qualified to speak to these things. And I said, you know what? That wasn't why I did that. Right. Because what I, why I did that was so that when people ignore me anyway, you can know that they're not telling the truth when they say they want to elevate black voices, right. right? Right. Because it doesn't matter what my story is to these folks. When they say they want to elevate minority voices, they are lying. They want to elevate Marxist voices. <clears throat> and if you're not a Marxist voice, then they don't consider you qualified voice. So to me, it is value uh, of that first part of the book because people still did, you know, they were like, yeah, no, Black voices, not his, you know, and, and, I, and I know, you know, what, what that's like, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. but, you know, my, my thought process was, these are things that I've been talking about and dealing with for a long time and having conversations with people uh, over for a long time. Josh, I remember, you know, sitting at your table in your house, you know, and, and us just sort of unpacking this stuff years ago, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and so this was this was a labor that took place over a long period of time, yeah. and the season was just right, and I felt like I, I, it was a burden. You know, I, I had to I had to release that burden. Yeah. In fact, I want to go to that very moment, uh, Vody, as I was really immersed in Southern Baptist life. I was seeing, you know, the the struggle, and I was watching a lot of voices that we had trusted in the past start to go really way off course. And I remember, honestly, I mean, I remember people that I trusted that were starting to confuse me. And there was that moment where you came to my house and we were sitting there at the, at the supper table and you really, for about three or four hours, I don't know how long, but it was a long conversation. You unpacked a lot of things that, that really helped me personally. And then beyond that conversation would come you know, again, the the meeting where we all circled up in Dallas and tried to really talk further about these things and diagnose these problems and and then figure out what would we do beyond that. And it, of course, ended up with, you know, the, the publication of the statement on social justice and the gospel. But, you know, the statement itself served a purpose. I mean, it, it clarified things. It was a spotlight in many ways. The spotlight was good. But I think your book went beyond that to defining terms and being very specific with the agenda that was driving it. So I think the book was massively important for the church. And so obviously I'm, I'm grateful that you wrote it. Yeah. And that was that was my goal. I, I appreciate you saying that, man, because that really was my goal. I love the church, brother. That that's at the, at the end of the day. I love the church and I believe the church was being harmed by this. 
And that that was it for me. Just love for the bride and a desire to uh, to to protect the, the bride, to defend the bride, um, to represent the bride well. Um, th at the end of the day, that was my hope. Yeah. And it, it was not easy because just like you, um, there were a lot of people um, who I believed then and believe now are on the wrong side of this. And it was it was difficult to uh, to address that. And, you know, a lot of people sort of um, criticized me for naming names, but it, it would have lacked integrity for me not to. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because, you know, we all knew who those names were. And, you know, I, I, I didn't malign anybody. Um, you know, in fact, in, in, in many areas of the book, I tried to um, give charitable explanations as to motivations, you know, for them to be going in some of these directions. But it, it was just incredibly important and everybody could see what was happening. Um, and and I, I just felt like we needed it, you know. I want to say one thing about that before we before we move on to your to this the video component piece of this and that is as as you mentioned that I thought the same thing as I read the book I thought we knew who the names were we knew who the people were we knew what had been said at the same time you wrote it in such a way uh, to to extend a, a bridge back for them I mean it, this wasn't a you know light, light the bridge on fire you know they're gone we're done you you, you named a name you made the statement. Um, and, and you were gracious even when you tried to address maybe motivations or issues that you may have seen that were challenges to people. And I, as I, I'm, I'm certain that those who read the book who are on the other side of the argument don't feel that you were charitable. Uh, but but there were there were a lot more things that could have been said uh, in you know as an as an effort to to kind of say hey they're they're gone we we don't need to hear from them again that's it they're done for. Uh, but I don't I didn't feel like you did I I didn't sense that that was the tenor of the book I really thought it was it was it was is, is there is there a lesson in that as we deal with contentious issues uh, with, with folks on different sides of, of, of the coin? Is, is that something you were thinking about or trying to model? Yeah. Na you know, naming names is, is very biblical. Right. Mm -hmm. Paul says Alexander, the coppersmith, did me great harm. <laughs> right. Not just Alexander. But you know which one I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The one who's got that shop over there on Main Street. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's very specific, you know. Um, and, and so it, it is it is biblical. The, the other thing is is it's honest, right? Because, you know, we're not just you know, being coy and saying, you know, some people out there somewhere, right? Uh, you know, that, that's not it. And, and the other thing is that there's accountability there, right? It's just, here's a statement that was made. Um, and, you know, just, just, sort of leave it at that. If, if people are making public statements, then then they're accountable, you know, for the things that, that they've said in public. So uh, that that was, you know, my, my thinking behind that. Um, and also for the for people to understand the magnitude, mm -hmm. right? If you just say there are some people out there, you know, who are dabbling in this or who may have that does not have the same impact as, um, you know, this person whom we know and love made this statement and this statement and this statement, right? Um, then it sort of, it, 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 it dawns, it, it just lands on people when you see half a dozen or a dozen um, of the people who we know and love and, you know, have been, have been blessed by, um, and there are these clear instances of them really being on the wrong side of this, it really lets people know that we're dealing with something serious. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, for all of those reasons, I think, I think it's important. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Vody. I think your motivation was clear. Uh, I think the people that, you know, took the book seriously and tried to understand, you know, the intention behind it, I think that they could sense that. It wasn't like you were attacking the character of the individual, you were dealing with the positions of the individual, which I think is it's what we should do. And by the way, I think that that was sort of what was lost within the Southern Baptist Convention for so long, and I think even still is today, this idea of kissing the ring. And of course, you've experienced that at various levels. I think when we have honest conversations about things that we might not agree upon, 
um, I think that it can be a benefit to the church. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I've been on I've been on the receiving end of that. You know, um, positions that I've taken that people over the years have have not uh, appreciated or have disagreed with. Um, you know, I, I've I've been on the receiving end of that, and it's it, it's clarifying. Um, it can be sharpening, um, but it's listen. We're we're men. And I think that's another issue. Um, I think, you know, we're living in this time where we've been so emasculated (laughs) that, you know, as I've often said, the 11th commandment is thou shalt be nice. And we don't believe the other 10. (laughs) And we we actually believe that manliness is sinful. Yeah. You know, Um, we believe that debate is sinful. Right. Um, And, and so I think that's part of, um, what we, what I experienced as well in terms of opposition to this, is that soft, effeminate, mm-hmm. um, you know, version of of modern Christianity that says, "No, you're mean." Um, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah so sorry, as we, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, brother, you don't have to qualify on this podcast, so you just speak freely, but. <laughs> In all seriousness, thinking about the heart and the motivation for the church and the importance of helping the church clarify dangers, that brings us beyond the book itself to this new series, this study series. So tell us a little bit about that and how people can access it. Yeah. You know, this is going back to my roots. My first book was The Everloving Truth, and there was The Everloving Truth Bible Study curriculum that came along along with it. Uh, that's where I started. And so I was really excited when, you know, the idea was floated and the opportunity came about to do this, this, this curriculum, to do this video series. And I love the idea of people being able to gather together and dive into this, you know, um, people who've read the book, who want to go deeper, who want to do it with a group, people who've read the book, who want to introduce it to others, people who, you know, want to have conversations about some of these things in a guided way. Um, I think there's so many ways that this material can be used and is being used. And I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah. I, I got a chance to get a, get a hold of some of this and kind of walk through uh, the, the 10, you know, uh, vignettes videos that you put together there. There's a lot of content to unpack in those. There was, I mean, just, uh, you know, the first one kind of unfolds uh, where you kind of lay out where you're going. Uh, the, the next one gives kind of, I mean, you, you take four and a half, five minutes just to lay out definitions. I mean, it was one definition after another definition, after another definition, after another definition. And so for, for people to know exactly kind of anchoring themselves in, here's what we, here's what we're saying. And here's what is meant by what is said. Uh, it really, it really lays things out. It, it does away with the with the old idea that we can't know what anything means, right? You laid everything out at right. the, at the beginning, uh, and then I think it, it strikes a chord. Uh, and I can't remember if it's the second or third video when you you kind of begin to tell the story of the police officer and he's he's on the he's on the neck of the individual and and here's what's happening yeah. and and I'm I'm ro- I'm rolling with you like I I never got a chance to hear Vody unpack you know George Floyd and you kind of sucker punch him and you give him a whole different he's I know you think I'm, I'm talking about George Floyd but really yeah. you're talking about Tony Tempa. And, and yeah. his story. And, and I think for, I, I, again, I, that's a, probably a spoiler alert. I probably should have let folks know I was going to do that. But uh, <laughs> it, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, man. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will say it, it was a, it was powerful the way you unpack that because what it does is it pulls the rug out from under the individual who has bought a specific narrative uh, and, and, and the response to that narrative as, as valid uh, and said, okay, if that's if that's the response in this situation, given that narrative that's valid, then what do you do with this guy's story? Um, it it caused I I literally paused, and I knew a little bit about the Tempest story. I literally paused the video and went back and and did some in depth reading. And my thought yeah. is, my thought is that's probably that was probably your intention for the audience that you were that you were uh, uh, you know delivering this to. For Absolutely. them to for them to begin thinking about it. you you want you want to kind of kind of unpack a little bit of your thoughts around that. 
Yeah, that was absolutely my intention. And, you know, there's a section in the book where I do that with a number of stories, right? I take a number of these stories um, that are used as, as, as evidence, right? As proof of, you know, the racism and policing and so on and so forth. And for each one of those stories, um, I give an example of a person who was white, mm -hmm. who had uh, almost the exact same uh, experience, uh, if not in, in some instances worse, mm -hmm. right, uh, than the ones that we say prove racism. And so, I, you know, I had to have an element of that in the, the video curriculum. And uh, I, I love the way, you know, that our, our videographer uh, Chocolate Knox, by the way, was the, the videographer on this. Yeah. And I, I love the way that that he just, you know, sort of brought all of that together. And, um, you know, I think your, your, your testimony speaks well to um, us achieving yeah. our goal yeah. in, in that segment. Yeah, it's powerful. Absolutely powerful. Yeah. So as we think about 2018, even pre-2018, Bodie, we think about, you know, the condition of you know evangelicalism, we think about you know beyond even the Southern Baptist Convention to all of the the major denominations, and then how this book and now this series I think will be a help to the church as well. But as we think about this fall, we're going to be having a conference on the sovereignty of God, and when we think about issues like you've been you know neck deep in this stuff you know for years now. Sometimes I think there's a tendency to sort of compartmentalize things like, well, this is the, you know, the scripture stuff over here. This is doctrine and Sunday stuff. And then here's the, the cultural stuff. But as we think about going into this fall with the, the, the conference, the, the national conference for G3 on the sovereignty of God, I think it's a critical opportunity for us to be reminded of the fact that God is sovereign over all of the spheres of life, family, church, and the civil sphere as well. And so really foundationally, as we study the Bible, we see the, the sovereignty of God as this foundational doctrine. And so talk to us a little bit about the sovereignty of God and how we should be thinking and, you know, really about all of life itself as it pertains to this doctrine. You know, what's really interesting is... Um, we're, we're just coming off the coronation of King Charles. That's right. And one of the interesting things about the coronation of King Charles is that there are a lot of parts of the Commonwealth that are now saying, hey, congratulations, King Charles. Um, we're leaving, right? Uh, <laughs> let, let, let us go. Um you know, Australia, for example, and Jamaica and, and other parts of the Commonwealth who are saying, you know, the time has come. And essentially what they're saying is the time has come for you to no longer be sovereign here. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's what people are saying. The time has come for you to no longer be sovereign here. And the reason that people are saying that that time has come is because that sovereignty is no more than symbolic anyway, right? Yeah. right? right. Um, and 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 so you you really don't rule here actually, um, so you probably shouldn't even rule here symbolically. And there are a lot of people who believe that we can do that with God, mm. that 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 we can say, "Hey, congratulations, God." Uh, it's great that you're sovereign over those people who believe in you, um, but we don't believe in you or, you know, we, we, we don't believe in you over here in this area. Uh, therefore, thanks, but no thanks. But God's sovereignty is absolute. God's sovereignty is not up for debate. God's sovereignty is rooted in God's person. Mm. God is the creator and ruler of the universe. And as creator and ruler of the universe, he is sovereign. Yeah. Uh, the way I like to say it is, you know, God's not running for God, right? <laughs> right. Um, he was the only one around when the votes were cast and there's never going to be a recap. <laughs> right. God is sovereign. Yeah. yeah. As, as, as we think about what's happening in, in culture, 
um, all of the issues that are pushing back against God's sovereignty, whether it's the, the LGBTQIA2+, uh, you know, g- g- give another designation of the alphabet mafia kind of kind of thing going on, or or the issues of gender. Well, I've decided today I'm, I'm not going to be a man. I'm going to be a... <laughs> it, it, all of it is a direct assault uh, on God's sovereignty. Yeah. Um, and as we yes. as we witness that happening in the culture, it's interesting at times and in segments of evangelical culture where people begin to kind of get mushy on these on these issues. Uh, perhaps they have a family member who's involved in, in, in something in particular or or, or or a friend of theirs or someone that they know. And just like with social justice, we have a tendency to kind of, be, you know, we, we want to be fair. We want to be kind. We want to, you know, the, we want to do the quote unquote loving thing. Right. We, we yeah. are seeing this. This, this happening and why is why would it, and as we begin to gather for our conference and remind people about God's sovereignty, Vody, what, what would you tell them about the importance of gathering to remind ourselves of of, of a doctrine like God's sovereignty? Why, why would that be important for for the believer? I think it's important because our sin is always warring against God's sovereignty. <laughs> In fact, one of the ways you can look at sin is. A, an assertion yeah. of our sovereignty over whatever sphere. Right. We're basically saying, God, you don't get to rule here. Wow. You don't get to rule in my sexuality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you don't get to rule. You don't even get to rule in my humanity. Mm-hmm. I get to define male and female. You don't get to define that, right? right. It, it is a way for us to usurp God's sovereignty. And so it's very important for us to be reminded, for all of us to be reminded of God's sovereignty. Because at the end of the day, our flesh wars for God's sovereign place. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, that's really, really good, Vody. And as we think about, uh, again, the the overarching doctrine of God's sovereignty, I, I just love how, you know, when we read the scriptures, we see that God is not disinterested in the small things. So he's interested in the average Sunday morning, you know, and, and the ordinary means of grace and the presentation of God to the people from the Word of God and the preaching of the Word. And he's also very much interested in how we view the world in terms of, you know, all sorts of disasters or, you know, even the nations raging against him or some nations being raised up and others being torn down. And so, I think it's critically important that we understand that this that this idea or this doctrine that we oftentimes refer to as the the sovereignty of God is not just in the realm of say, you know, Calvinism or right. the doctrines of grace, right. but it's it's a holistic doctrine that really encompasses the whole of life. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. God is sovereign. Yeah. He's sovereign over everything everywhere. It's all his, and he re- he rules it by right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, thinking back to uh, the very beginning of G3, uh, brother, it's, uh, it's been a privilege to have you with us since the very beginning. I think you've only missed one G3 conference. And before, hey, we were at G3 before it was cool, man. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. And so we've got, you know, big plans this year, obviously, and we look forward to having you with us, Virgil. Uh, talk to us. Yeah. And, in fact, tell Vody, you know, the plans in terms of the numbers. Yeah. I mean, this is astounding to me. Vody, it's, it's been amazing what we've seen, what we've witnessed here. I don't know how, how closely you've been keeping track, but we've got um, normally during during our, our same time frame, we, we'll have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15, 1,800, maybe, maybe a couple thousand people that have registered at this point. About 60 percent of our registrants actually happen like at this last, you know, last little bit, like the last three months. 60 percent of our numbers yeah. will actually come in. Last year, we were somewhere in the neighborhood at this time, about, like I said, 2,000. And then we ended up that year in 2021 with about 6,500 people. Uh, at the conference, as it as as we roll into 2023, currently we're sitting a little bit over 6,000 people right now that are currently registered for the conference, and if if 60 percent are are yet to come, Vody, we won't have room for everybody. 
Uh, that's wow. kind of <laughs> that's kind of how the numbers are are, are tracking, and and we've got wow. we've got massive plans for this year. Uh, we're excited to have you joining us uh, along with it with a great roster of folks who've been with us for quite some time, and it's going to be an amazing amazing uh, conference that we're we're looking forward to having having you be a part of as well. So I'm, I'm glad I got a seat, brother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we think about uh, again the the plans we have for the fall, we look forward to having you with us, Vody. Thank you for taking time away to join us for the G3 podcast today. Absolutely, man. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. God bless you. Bless you, bro. That was a great conversation that we had with Vody. We're hopeful that you uh, enjoyed that. Before we completely wrap up, Josh, you got any final thoughts about that conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually agree with, you know, Vody on the things that he was laying out in this conversation. I think it's really important and helpful when we have conversations, sometimes even difficult conversations, yeah. and we actually, you know, dive into the issues and sometimes have to talk directly to individuals. Mm-hmm. In this case, I think Vody demonstrated um, measured wisdom, yeah. but also he was courageous in how he addressed the problems of the day and identified the fault lines of the day. And I think that that's critically important. And so I'm gra- I- I'm grateful for his friendship. I'm grateful for his stand, his boldness, but also I'm really grateful for this series. And I do hope that that many of you that are watching this podcast or listening to this podcast We'll take advantage of this resource. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic resource, done incredibly well. I'm sure you're going to benefit. We're hopeful as well with regard to our conversation with Vody in this podcast uh, that you were benefited and edified uh, by that conversation. Uh, definitely want you to join us next time as we have great conversations with great guests uh, as well as talk about key issues and theological matters. With that said, thank you for joining us for this edition of the G3 Podcast. Yeah, I had to think about that, bro. <laughs> like and subscribe oh, and put your like, comments like. down too because sometimes we actually engage there yeah, yeah, as yeah, well yeah, yeah. so thank you so much for joining us for the g3, g3 podcast, podcast. <laughs> use his outro <laughs> uh.